And Michael, you brought some objects here to me. What did you bring it all for us to have a look at? I brought a pot, a pot or a skillet, as we call it. And this was supposed to be in Lord Donnelly's trap going to church in Silver Mines. And when he came up from the big house and came out to the green gates on the Silver Mines, on the Silver Mines Dollar Road, and when he straightened up on the street, the shots were fired. And this pot was supposed to be in the trap. And my grandfather came on the scene and he got he seen the pot. And Lord and Ellie was supposed to have said to him, take it away out of the way. Mikey Michael Quindon was his name as well. And he said, Take the take the pot away, Michael. Because I think there was something in it for the horse like and probably food. And grandfather cut the pot and he turned it in over the wall till by. And after he was when he was working there, he he picked up the pot and took it home. And he got he saw the initials on it and he seen the bullet hole, the bullet wound on the pot. And that was that morning, nineteen sometime nineteen twenty two. And he said it to Lord Donnelly after. And Lord, he told Lord Donnelly about having the pot. And he says, Asher Mikey, he says, you'll mind it or look after it. But my father trained as a gamekeeper in Kilby. And he used to feed the dogs over that, his own dogs at home after that. So that's supposed to be the history of it anyway. Like. And we never looked at it. I used to use it for getting out mail out of a, a barrel for for the cattle or things like that. But other than that, like, that's the, most of the history I have about it. That it was fired at and that was a bullet hole, a bullet wound, and the initials on it are SW and I don't know who they are or where they're from. And there was no one killed that day? No, there was no one killed that day. The, there's John said Flannery said uh, the initial was not to shoot Lord Anelli, it was just to frighten to get him out of the land because they had something like 18,000 acres now I'm not fully sure but I know that they had that that amount was mentioned anyway in the area and my grandfather we were tenant farmers at that time there 1922. When was the house burnt down? In 1922 it was supposed to be a beautiful house. Now we had forces a, a force about that home. It was, it was burnt in 1922. And a couple of years ago, there now, it was rebuilt back to the original of what it was. That's what I'm told of the plans. And it's supposed to have cost something like 52 million. And it was a tourist man that by owns Kilby, owned the Kilby at that stage, Tony Ryan of Ryanair. And his son, Cahill, as far as I think it's Cahill is his name, Cahill, Tony died before the house was finished. But it's, origin, it's back to the original of what it was. It's supposed to be beautiful now. I'd love to see it myself, like, because as, I, as a kid, I played with young Francis Danelli and Mary Rose Danelli down with with neighbours of mine, the Pat, you know, Martin Sheehan and Pat Sheehan, you know. And um, I'd love to see it like, but I think you nearly have to have a security badge to go in there now. But other than that, like, that's what I can remember about it, like, you know. You can remember as a chap playing with the Danelli. Oh, I do. I, I played with Francis Danelli. And I cycled his little three-wheel bike at the time. We used to go up and down, as I said earlier on, up and down where the Scouting Bridge is, up the avenue, you know. And uh, we all, as, as the Quinlans, I don't know why, but my grandfather and all of us got on fantastic with Lord and Ellie, and my father as well. But the only all of us kept it as a kind of a friendship, not else like, you know. And you've got some objects on the table here that came from that house? I have. I have this mirror was supposed to be in one of the bedrooms. 
that was in Kilby House the time it was burnt down. Now, it was my grandfather who was supposed to have got, he got it. And it was at home in our place for years and years and years. And it was never used. Never used. Now, the plates were ornaments on the wall. They were hanging on the wall like, like pictures. And they were in the hallway. Down on, it was supposed to be down on the hallway. But they said there was an awful lot of stuff taken. That these, there were way bigger plates altogether. But those was the ones I heard my grandfather, my father saying. That them. And the objects was, this object here was supposed to be something like the top of the mirror but way bigger over the bed. And this was the that probably fell off of it or something like that. And my grandfather picked it up, took it away, it's no good. Now those object, there's an object here now, this thing now, I just remembered it like. He got that off of a jacket that was thrown out in Lord and Alice. The jacket was thrown for the dump and he just took that off of it. And that badge is a, for Catholic emancipation, is that right? It is, something like that, yeah. And this one here came in a saucepan out of the kitchen. A lady that lived next, more much next door to me was a, a woman called Mrs. Gleeson. She was a Waterford woman. She married John Gleeson in Butterby. And I think she was a cook in the kitchen. In the kitchen. And that saucepan came to, to Gleeson's in Butterby. And Gleeson's uh, originally, they're, they're all diminished now, like, you know, they're all dead and gone. But the, when I was young, when we were young, that's, we, we got that saucepan. Down, we used to be playing it, what they call Cubby, Cubby at that time, and the saucepan was kicked and bro and bent and broken. It was like aluminium, or good tin anyway, and I took that off of it. And I tried since to see could I locate where that came from, where where. And, but it's Wolver, It was made in Wolverhampton, but the company is supposed to be dissolved for years and years and years. After that, like. And all the tenants on the on the farm and that land, what happened to them after? They all, well, you see, when when the place was burnt down in 1922, um, my father often said to me, "Oh, he was my father was born in 1912, 1911, I think it was. Yeah, 1911, and in March 1911, and like he'd be only 11 at that stage, like." But he, he can remember people there that had to immigrate. There were 60 people or something like that working in Kilby at that stage, which is an awful amount of people in a small area, and they have nothing, you know. And he said, the morning after being burnt, there was only about a half a dozen people working in. Because there was nothing, nothing there, and the cattle were stole off the land, and the, Everything in it was stole off the land. So no, the Nelly wasn't the Nelly wasn't there. Nineteen twenty two and it burned down. He was supposed to be out in India or out somewhere. He was a an army man now. Eh? But other than that now, I have a lot more information on it. As only I, I get the more from reading the book now because what my father and grandfather told me and even my mother. My mother only died four and a half years ago. She was ninety-five and a half. But she talk about more about it than my because her aunts, the Coleman's from Traverse Town in Dalla, they know more about it at that stage as well, like you know. And um, she learned more as well from them, right? and heard more. Core Deacon at night time. And are you happy that you managed to? save these and keep these up? Well I'm very happy. 
I'm very happy to keep the tradition going. And I'm a member of the Silver Mines Historical Society, where I was reared. And uh, I'm gone off of it about 55 years altogether. But some, I, I'll be buried in Kilmore. I know where my wife will be buried, but I'll be buried in Kilmore anyway. So, and I have six kids, four boys and two girls. And they're all working. They all have good jobs. So, and a lot, um, a, a lot of them are very interested in the mines. It's like, you know, so it's going back to the old heritage again now. Blood is thicker than water. It's like when the mines, I, I hold with Shannon Rovers, I hold in London, but I hold with Shannon Rovers and I could never bear to see him playing the silver mines because I wouldn't shout for either side like I couldn't. So now that's another part like, you know, but that's me and Kilby. Now there was lots of other stuff that was I seen back the time, but there were in other houses that was in Butterby. And all the Butterbees, like, they worked for the Nelly in their time. They were the, they were the Nelly's houses. And uh, I don't know what ever happened to some of the stuff in There was some very valuable stuff in it. I don't know what ever happened to them. Well, I'm glad you managed to get your hands on these and save them and keep them for, for us and tell the story of them. And yeah, well, they were, they, they, they were saved. They were... They done up the house at home, I think in nineteen seventy seven or something. And there was a lot of doors up in the loft in an old attic in it. And I picked them up and they were full of dust, cobwebs, everything. And I just brought them down and I said to my mother, my mother said to me, Throw out them, they're no good. And that was it, bear the pot now, the pot was always around the yard, like, you know. But these other things now on the swing that we'll have later on. Like, but those, those items now were brought down and I just dusted them to see. And of course, like when I was young, I wanted to know where they're valuable. And they're valuable in, in a different way? In different ways, yes, exactly, yeah. In different ways, yeah. I suppose like this stuff will never be made again. Yeah. You know. Will we have a look at that swing? Yes. Like, where did that come from? That swing came out of Kilby. And my father used it for years, slinging timber for himself. But it was used in Kilby for slinging timber with horses. And the chain, this chain isn't original, but that is the original chain that used to go on to the horses uh, backing and, his, and the hams on the collar. Now that's only a bit of it I, I have, like I don't know where the rest of it, but that is the original chain. You can see the rust and everything is on it, like. And that is the original swing shirt. It's, low, it's rotten with rust now. But this crook here wasn't, as far as I know, the original crook because it was made for the, the chain used to go in like that. You know, the chain used to go in somewhere like, like that and the horse would be pulling it in, like this. But it wouldn't go into it. And this was made. This was made for it. But that chain and this crew is the originals. Belong to this swing. But that swing was used in Kilby for slinging timber. Now my father didn't sling timber for Kilby. But I don't know who was the timber men in it at the time. For Lord and Ellie's fires and all that. But this was brought, this was brought out of Kilby when Lord and Ellie was selling. And that was used then just to pull the... It was, it was actually, it was given to me father. My father was talking to Lord and Elliot, I'm, I, and he said, Paddy was my father, Patrick was his name, but Paddy. And he said, Paddy, he said, if that's any good to you, he says, take it away. And I was a young lad, my father handed it to me. He says, take that out, throw it up in the cart. And that's how the windows got. And I had, and I carried on with it, because I had the farm, and I, I got the farm, and I sold it because, you know. But uh, this this swing is supposed to have swung an awful lot of timber, 
and you'd know by the, the wear and tear here, it is nearly burnt out to nothing. And years and years and years of hardship, I suppose. And there, there were a lot of trees on, on the land. Oh, there was some of them. I can still picture the size of them. There was, I remember, the two Californian redwoods at the Scourn Bridge. And to look up at them, you nearly get a diesel in your head. They were that height. And of course, they're only growing in California more. And, but they said a nurseryman down near me now in Ballanderry, the late Matt Fogarty, he was a brilliant man. I went all over Wexford with him to nurseries picking up different items of trees and all that. And Matt said, the reason we can't grow them trees really in Ireland, they won't survive like the, Cali like the Californian red ones in America because lightning and the weather is too cold. But if uh, I remember when them trees was caught, and I think it was Robinson Brothers, they were from Port Arlington or back that direction, they cut him down. And I remember looking at him, uh, and, and I was only a young lad, well, I never grew too much since, but I was hardly able to get up to the diameter on the, <coughs> on the trees. Now, there was only the two of them, as far as I can remember, in or each side of what they called the Scourton Bridge. Were there many trees cut down or felled? Oh, there was hundreds of them. Hundreds of them. There was one field there now, they called it the Black Orchard. It was a massive field, and uh, I think there were about 25 acres in it. And my good friend, Phil Sheehan, he still lives there. And uh, a chap at the Quigley's, I can't think of his name now, he owns the field now. But I remember beech or oak trees in that field. There was three or four of them together. And when we were youngsters, we seen them, we seen the Robertson brothers, I think. So I'm sure Robertson was their names, or Robertson, and the cutting them. And the chainsaw that they had, there was an engine at each side of the chainsaw to get around them trees for the cut them. There were massive trees, massive. It was a species to see them being done, but I suppose when times are hard, a man will do anything for to make a bob. And that's what they were sold for. And the mighty beach is all along the side of the road as well. And there was an oak tree in it in Kilby, over near what we call the Green Gate, and it was six foot in diameter when it was cut down. Now Moore says it wasn't, and Moore said it was, but my father always said, he was talking to the men that cut it, and they had the measurements, and he said it was six foot in diameter. So like, you thought, I'm only five foot nothing, you can imagine what. And it was, I'd say, about 30 foot without a branch. It was, a, it was sad to see him go on, but all the big timber was cut out killed by that time. Now Tony Ryan or Ryanair has planted an, uh, an amount of timber, but I never see him, I suppose my grandchildren won't ever see him, the timber the high seeing, you know. But so a lot of the people didn't have got the land, they didn't know how to, didn't know how to work it. There was land there, still land there, that the bushes were out. Ten, 10 yards out in the fields. They didn't come for the Nellies, so they weren't going to come for themselves. So, you know, so. your, your grandfather worked in the estate? My grandfather worked in the estate, he did. And his, grand, his father, or his brother, Edward Quindlin, now, was, a, was the Nellies' tailor in Kilby. And he was going down to work one morning and he, at six o'clock, and it was dark, and he met two fellas coming up in bikes, up the avenue, and they had a, they had a handlebars and the bike riddled with rabbits, after snaring them or catching them. And they warned him, if he opened his mouth, he'd never put a foot in Kilby again. And shortly after that, he packed bag in bags, and he head for Johannesburg in South Africa. And I don't, he, he, I don't think he was ever back again. And there was a teen now I had a watch at home that he sent to my grandfather, a pocket watch, 
på att hitta sin mor och blad och något. Det var en gold watch. Jag sa till mig en pocket watch. Jag sa att jag har det framme. Jag sa att jag skulle ha blad. Jag sa att jag inte hade gått in till det stället. Men han gick till Sydafrika. Och jag hade väldigt liten kontakt med honom efter det. Så det är historien igen. Och vi har varit i Borhörby sedan 1861. My grandfather got married and he came to Borrowby. The Quinlans he's, are in Borrowby since 1861. My great-grandfather, no, came to in 1861, and his name was Michael Quinlan as well.